Welcome everyone, it's great to see the room full. And once again, the Crawford School, every time I come here, uh, hints to me that we need a larger set of rooms in this uh, complex. Uh, before I begin, I would like to acknowledge and celebrate the first Australians on whose lands we meet, the Ngunnawal people, and pay my respects to their elders past and present. Your Excellencies, Ambassador of Japan, High Commissioner of Canada, High Commissioner of South Africa, and other members of the Diplomatic Corps, distinguished international visitors, ladies and gentlemen. I'm delighted uh, this uh, afternoon to join this international conference on Indo-Pacific Maritime Security Challenges and Cooperation, hosted by the ANU's National Security College. And it is my privilege to introduce to you in the next few moments our keynote speaker, Admiral uh, Scott Swift, commander of the US Pacific Fleet, and I've had a very interesting conversation with him over the last 20 minutes, and uh, you are in for really getting a deep insight into uh, the topic of uh, this meeting. As the National University of Australia, ANU has a mission to foster policy debate, policy insight, and provide policy ideas on the issues critical to Australia's future. This goes hand in hand with excellence in research and teaching, and this event is part of our mission, the very core of our mission. In the area of national security and related fields of statecraft, that is very much the philosophy of the National Security College, our own NSC. Recently, for instance, the college has convened a week-long international conference on cybersecurity. I got to be part of that as well. This involved academia, government, and industry. And it was intended and did generate new concepts and partnerships to protect Australia's interest in that critical and emerging domain. Along with the Crawford School and Indian partner institutions, the NSC has recently held a bilateral dialogue, dialogue in New Delhi, the Australian India Policy Forum. And this uh, will help inform an important and growing bilateral relationship across the full policy spectrum between our two countries. And later this year, the NSC has plans for a conference with Chinese academics on counterterrorism and related issues. As you see, we're covering the whole area, uh, and uh, that is one of the remits of the Crawford School and the NSC. This week's conference, however, is decidedly marathon. It is focused on security challenges and partnerships in a region becoming known as the Indo-Pacific. No doubt that concept will be debated here, but it could be described as a fresh way of looking at what has been, we have been accustomed to calling the Asia Pacific, with an emphasis on the economic and in strategic importance of the oceans and the sea lanes. These discussions are not solely about any one country, and we have eminent expert speakers from Indonesia, China, and India, as well as many leading Australian academics and not all of them from the ANU. That is part of what the National University is, is not just to be us, but bringing together the entire nation. For the reasons that Professor Metcalf has noted in an earlier session, there is also an emphasis on the perspectives of Japan. As the recent Australian Defense White Paper has affirmed, Australia needs to develop new regional partnerships to ensure its prosperity and security in the coming century. The Defense White Paper also states, however, that a strong and deep alliance is at the core of Australia's security and defense planning. Our keynote speaker today knows full well the meaning behind those words. Admiral Scott Swift is one of the most distinguished and senior officers in the US Navy and carries great responsibilities for regional security as commander of the US Pacific Fleet with its headquarters in sunny Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. Admiral Swift attended San Diego State University and received his commission in 1979 through the Aviation Reserve Officer Candidate Program. He received his master's degree from the Naval War College, Newport, Rhode Island. His senior operational assignments include Deputy Commander, Naval Forces, U.S. Central Command Commander, Carrier Strike Group 9, and Commander U.S. 7th Fleet. During those tours, he participated in combat operations Praying Mantis, Southern Watch, Enduring Freedom, and Iraqi Freedom. His shore tour assignments include Commander of Strike Fighter Weapons School, Pacific, 
Officer of the Undersecretary of Defense for Acquisition, Technology, and Log uh, Logistics Staff, and Director of Operations, U.S. Pacific Command. Prior to assuming command at U.S. Pacific Fleet, he was assigned to the Pentagon as Director of Navy Staff. Admiral Swift is entitled to wear the Distinguished Service Medal, Defense Superior Service Medal, Legion of Merit, Bronze Star, and Meritorious Service Medal, along with various other awards, which I think I could probably go on based on what's here all day. Our speaker is no stranger to Australia and this region. I think he said it's his fifth trip to Canberra, and he appreciated that the weather was very nice today and maybe not always like this. Uh, and this is particularly from his time as commander of the 7th Fleet based in Japan. It gives me great pleasure to invite Admiral Swift to share his insights on the regional security challenges and cooperation. Admiral Swift. Well, it's, great to, uh, it's great to be here this morning. Uh, I see many familiar faces in the, uh, in the crowd. I have a few comments that I'd like to make uh, up front, but I'm most interested in, uh, in getting to the, uh, to the questions and, and comments that uh, you all may have and, and turn this into a, a two-way uh, educational uh, experience. Um, I'm traveling with uh, Lieutenant General uh, Tulin, uh, my naval partner in the uh, Pacific. Uh, he wears uh, two hats. He's the commander of uh, Marine Forces in the Pacific, uh, but he's also uh, the commander of uh, Fleet Marine Forces in the Pacific. Uh, and in that hat, he's actually subordinate to me when uh, Marines are embarked. And then, of course, uh, he uh, takes a leadership a role of those Marines when they disembark and are ashore. Uh, so it's great to be traveling with John and, uh, and his team. Uh, I'd like to offer a special thanks to the uh, National Security College here at the uh, Australian uh, National University and the Embassy of Japan in Australia for co-hosting uh, this event. I'm particularly heartened by the diversity of opinion and perspective uh, represented uh, by those uh, attending this important forum. As I've said many times before, these opportunities for inclusive dialogue help to push us beyond admiring the problem of the day and toward developing uh, more predictive, long-term responses to shared concerns. This conference falls at an important moment, both in my tenure as the commander of the U.S. Pacific Fleet and for the broader Indo-Asia Pacific region that, uh, that I serve in. Over the past 10 months, I've traveled throughout this region from the west coast of the United States to Northeast Asia, to Southeast Asia, South Asia, and most recently to the large ocean nations of Oceania. All of these sub-regions are vital parts of the vast Indo-Asia Pacific through which not only our economies flow, but the global economy as well. Some have described the Indo-Asia Pacific as the economic engine that drives the global economy. Whether your views are as grand as that, uh, I have not found anyone that, who disagrees with the notion that the regional economy drove the rising tide of prosperity that has lifted so many from poverty. All of our nations, large and small, have major equities in the international rules-based system established in the wake of World War II that it has been foundational as an enabler to this rising tide. Over the past 70 years, this principled system has fostered a highly interconnected neighborhood in which exclusivity and hierarchy have no place. We are all locals here. There are no outsiders or subordinate states among the Indo-Asia Pacific nations. We are all given voice after World War II, regardless of economic stature, heritage, culture, form of government, or military strength. Some nations do not see it this way, and seeking to right perceived imbalances or wrongs of the past are abandoning the international rules-based system in the process. As a consequence, portion of the sea, portions of the sea are besieged by word or deed to serve unilateral interests alone. Manifest by unprecedented examples of aggressive construction and militarization on disputed land features, as well as legal appeals to uh, historic pasts that are inconsistent with international law. 
there is a palpable sense that an arc of right makes right is returning to the region after more than 70 years of security and stability. Attempts to justify these activities at sea are often based on channeling nationalistic history outward, the sort of thing that may stoke patriotism at home, but has no place among responsible nations in international waters. It's becoming increasingly clear that a contest is underway in the most vulnerable waters of the Indo-Asia Pacific. As mentioned earlier, on one side is a potential return of might makes right after more than 70 years of stability. On the other is a continuum of international rules-based system that has served us so well with limitless potential to continuing to do so. Though larger nations are certainly affected by these new challenges to the freedoms we enjoy and to the rules-based system, in particular, smaller nations that border disputed waters are most vulnerable and increasingly alarmed by these disruptive trends. Charmless offenses, which have offered dubious reassurances in the past, are clearly no longer charming and no longer adequate to buy silence or distract regional countries from aggressive activities occurring just beyond their shores. Regional rhetoric is catching up to this reality. Late last month, the chairman of the Association of Southeast Asian Nations and separately, Singapore's Minister of Foreign Affairs raised the region's concerns about growing maritime instability at a summit in Laos. The chairman noted that colleagues from all 10 ASEAN nations, and I quote, remain seriously concerned over the recent and ongoing developments, end quote, and as such, quote, land reclamations and escalation of activities in the area, end quote. Reminding us that maritime disputes involve many more nations than just the direct claimants, Foreign Minister, Foreign Minister Dr. Bala Krishnan said, and I quote again, Singapore is not a claimant state. Nevertheless, because we are a small country, we have to firmly adhere with the concept of a rules-based world order. In other words, we cannot have a world where might makes right, end quote. I also hear clear and direct expressions of this anxiety from every regional leader and geopolitical expert I meet with during my many travels throughout the region. There are two primary elements driving this anxiety. First is the disproportionate scope, scale, and acceleration of the disruptive activities I have mentioned before, especially in contested areas and surrounding waters. Second is a lack of transparency about the intentions of some regional navies, coast guards, and paramilitary forces under their command. The resulting climate of uncertainty not only threatens freedom of the seas and chips away at the rules-based system, it encourages nations to transfer ever largest share of national wealth to purchase naval weapons beyond what is needed merely for self-defense. More and more media reports reflect broad concern for rising military budgets, as well as calls for greater transparency and a clear explanation of intentions. Relatedly and most troubling are the undeniable signs of militarization in select parts of the region, unprecedented in terms of scope and scale. The seeds of this militarization were sown by garrisons established decades ago in barely habitable outposts. Now, many of their original blockhouses are dwarfed by thousands of acres of reclaimed land with newly constructed barracks, deep water ports, extended runways, high power radars, surface to air missiles, and squadrons of naval aircraft. Restric recent restrictions on internet and press freedoms by some nations may very well reflect their true intentions toward all forms of international exchange. Freedom across cyberspace may be less tangible than freedom of navigation for ships at sea, but it is no less consequential in today's interconnected world. Successful imposition of restricted national laws in international waters would likely require militarization. 
For these reasons, I remain concerned that the freedoms of the seas in some Indo-Asia Pacific waters is not only at risk by long-standing challenges like piracy, smuggling, and other illicit activities, it is increasingly vulnerable to a state-led resurgence of the principle of might makes right. I believe there is a clear choice of a best practice to emulate and replicate among the competing visions I have outlined, one that can be illustrated within the vast Indo-Asia Pacific region. Just after the new year, I visited India and Bangladesh. In Bangladesh, I attended the Indian Ocean Naval Symposium where I remarked that if I stood in the Straits of Malacca, looking east into the South China Sea and East China Sea, I saw protracted maritime disputes and a lack of transparency in contested waters. Looking west into the Indian Ocean, I saw neighboring nations, large and powerful such as India, as well as smaller and more vulnerable such as Bangladesh and Myanmar, Burma, working together in international fora to resolve similar types of disputes peacefully and promote an inclusive climate of cooperation at sea. By submitting long-standing disputes to international institutions and agreeing to honor the outcomes, these nations demonstrated the responsible application of a 70-year-old model forged in war, tested by time, modified by consensus decisions, and adjudicated in accordance with international law. If I now, here today, recenter my orientation from the Straits of Malacca to the center of the Indian Ocean, I am struck by what I see looking west. There the situation deteriorates rapidly in parts of Eastern Europe, the Levant, and the Maghreb. Ongoing turmoil in Syria, Libya, and Ukraine reflects the resurgent challenges of international terrorism, failed states, and large states invi invading their much smaller neighbors. These challenges extend to the vital waters of the Mediterranean Sea and the Black Sea, which enabled the prosperity that region has enjoyed for so long. Here in the Indo-Asia Pacific, we would do well to notice that these seas are now vectors of instability plaguing the region. Put simply, might makes right is taking root in these places in ways that continue to challenge existing regional governance structures and are spreading to the international community, in large part, from the sea. So I end with a, a message of hope, concern, and reality. Hope that the international rules-based system that has served us so well, regionally as well as globally, for the last 70 years will remain the gold standard for issue resolution. We have only to look as far as the nations that border the Indian Ocean for an example and an affirmation that nations great and small and are valued by what up to now has been an enduring model of issue resolution and stability. Concern, concern that my example of standing in the middle, middle of the Indian Ocean, what I view in a rel as a relatively sea of as a relative sea of tranquility and looking west into the increasing chaos of the Mediterranean and the Black Seas may be analogous to looking through a window at a potential future for the Indo-Asia Pacific region. And last, that the reality is demonstrated from the days of sail, the great British, French, and Spanish armadas, as true today as then, that the canary in the coal mine of regional and global stability and prosperity isn't found in a cave, but on international waters. We have assumed so long these international seas are the domain of all free men. Perhaps now we too easily dismiss these freedom enablers, these guarantors of stability and prosperity as simply freedom of navigation. In closing on the theme of this conference, challenges, opportunities, and cooperation, I suggest while we could admire the example set for us by our Indian Ocean friends, we have an obligation to ensure that the opportunity the Indian Ocean example presents 
is leveraged to ensure, ensure that all rise to the challenge of ensuring the sea of tranquility does not become an oasis more defined by the chaos that surrounds it than by the stability within. The key to ensuring the longevity and application of this Indian Ocean model throughout the rest of the Indo-Asia Pacific region is cooperation. Cooperation in the form of applying the same international rules-based system of accepted norms, standards, rules, and laws that have served us so well, so long, and well into the future. Thank you. I look forward to the opportunity of expanding my knowledge through your informative questions and comments. Thank you. Uh, Admiral, please, please don't go away. That's, uh, I think, been a very, uh, a very valuable and, and quite compelling exposition of the issues. And I particularly valued the way in which you, uh, you looked at the, uh, the, the comparisons and the analogies with, with different regions and different sub-regions, including, interestingly, uh, the Mediterranean as well as uh, the South China Sea and the Indian Ocean. We have time for some questions, and I certainly want to offer an opportunity to as many of you as possible to ask questions of Admiral Swift. So, the way we'll proceed, I'll ask you to raise your hands, and uh, you, you're, you're first, sir. I ask you to raise your hands, and when the microphone comes to you, please identify yourself as we are on the public record. I'll probably take uh, about three questions at a time, uh, and then give the Admiral uh, opportunity to address them. So we'll start with this gentleman, and then the young woman uh, further back. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Admiral. Uh, Tang Jianqun from China Institute of International Studies. I used to uh, be a naval officer in the South China Sea Fleet Headquarters of PRA Navy. Uh, as I should salute to you. And uh, in recent years, we have witnessed that the uh, competition between China and the United States has been intensified, especially in the South China Sea. And uh, as, you know, we are puzzled a little bit about the attitude by the U.S. Navy and U.S. Uh, Air Force uh, toward this region. Some said this is a competition between a traditional uh, maritime power and a new uprising uh, maritime power. It's not only an a issue of uh, freedom of navigation. So what is your comment? And the second is a technical question. You know, in recent, in recent days, I think last week or the week, uh, a week ago, uh, the US uh, aircraft carrier battle group Stannis in a uh, just in the South China Sea, and uh, there were some uh, PRA Navy vessels came very close to the uh, battle group. Do you think it's a professional uh, response from the Chinese side according to the MOU you know, between the two sides? Thank you. Um, two questions here, so I think you should take them. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for the questions. and. Uh, Thank you for being here today. And if you would pass my congratulations to Admiral Su to his uh, recent appointment uh, to his new position. As the PLA is going through a restructuring, uh, I think his responsibilities have uh, expanded uh, greatly. Um, I had the pleasure of visiting uh, Shanghai recently, and, and I had uh, uh, deep and extensive discussions with Admiral Su, and, and I was uh, privileged to go to Beijing after that and uh, enjoyed a uh, extended evening with Admiral Wu uh, as well. Um, so to the, uh, uh, to the first question on uh, activities in the South China Sea uh, with the uh, PLAN units and uh, Pacific uh, Fleet units, um, I, I don't see the situation there on the water as, as being changed. Uh, both Admiral Su and Admiral Wu and I talked about uh, the difference of opinion at the national level between uh, the Chinese government and the U.S. government. And uh, we, we all three agreed that it was very important for us as naval leaders to ensure uh, that uh, those disagreements did not manifest themselves uh, on, on the waters at sea as our navies uh, interact together. And in fact, the uh, code for uh, uh, unalerted encounters at sea has been a very positive development. And uh, the engagements, the dialogue that occurs at sea between the captains of uh, PLAN ships and, and the Pacific Fleet ships uh, is, uh, is, is very positive. Uh, 
the, I think the core to that first question is uh, best answered uh, by uh, comments that Secretary of Defense Carter made um, that the U.S. would continue to sail and fly in accordance with uh, international law, which is what uh, we have uh, continued to do uh, as a force. Uh, the Stennis Strike Group was recently in the, uh, in the South uh, China Sea. Um, there was interaction, as there always is, uh, in the seas between uh, U.S. naval units and uh, PLA and uh, units as well. Um, all, I would characterize all these uh, interactions as, as being very positive, uh, bridge to bridge exchanges as you would expect would occur uh, between any uh, sailors at, at sea uh, is the norm that, that uh, marked uh, the interaction of, of these vessels. Thank you. I think uh, the young woman here and then uh, you and Graham here. Hi, I'm Darshana from the Observer Research Foundation in Delhi and I'm also currently with the Crawford School here at ANU. Um, I have two quick questions. Uh, when we talk about the Indo-Pacific, we mostly end up talking most about the countries of ranging from India, Australia, Indonesia, Japan. I want to know your viewpoints on what about these smaller island nations in the region like Maldives, Mauritius, Seychelles, and even uh, South Pacific, and what kind of role do you see them playing in the emerging and uh, security discourse that's shaping in the region, especially in light of Chinese investments in these islands? Um, second question in relation to the South China Sea disputes. Um, in recent few past weeks, there has been a lot in the media about uh, U.S. leadership uh, encouraging India to play a larger role in the South China Sea. Um, does U.S. really believe that India is ready or prepared to carry out joint patrols in the South China Sea because India doesn't seem to be ready itself? And if that is leading to concern somewhere about slowing down the process of new pace in, in the U.S. maritime relationship about U.S. pushing India too hard at public forums on an issue such as the South China Sea. Thank uh, you. We'll, I'll, I'll restrict others to one question at a time, also to be able to share, uh, but thank you. The, um, uh, well, it's great to see you again, a little bit uh, different than, uh, than the last time we saw each other in, in uh, Delhi, which I think is reflective of the common interest broadly uh, across the, uh, the region. Um, to the issues, uh, size in my mind is not a uh, significant factor. Um, international laws are not based on the size of any one country's economy or uh, what its claims may be. It, it is the equalizer of, uh, of all nations. Uh, so as I say, as I made the comments in Delhi, I wrote an op-ed for the, the paper and then uh, uh, follow on engagements in, uh, in Bangladesh. Uh, that it, I do think that there's a model to follow, that, that uh, the resolution of some of the disputes between India, a very large, powerful uh, nation by every measure, population, military, economy, uh, chose to go to international arbitration and, uh, and to accept the outcome of that arbitration uh, with a much smaller and more vulnerable country uh, like uh, Bangladesh. And I think the result is you see the continued uh, prosperity and growth within the uh, the uh, Indian Ocean uh, region. Um, the uh, the ions, I think, was uh, also reflective of uh, the broad engagement and embracing of these international norms, standards, and rules and laws by all the nations uh, in the Indian Ocean. Um, certainly, Sri Lanka and India, Bangladesh, Burma, uh, the Maldives, uh, Seychelles, others as well. I note that uh, Spain uh, had representatives there, as did Germany, many, many of the European countries, and of course, many of the, uh, the Pacific as well. So I, I think this is a model to be held up uh, as an example. Um, I'm aware of the comments that have been made about uh, uh, India's role uh, in the region. Um, I continue uh, to be a, a, an advocate and a supporter of the Indian nation and Admiral uh, Doan's view and the, the Indian's Navy, Admiral Doan's view of the future of that Navy and the Indian government. But I think it's very important that, that, um, that there, the dialogue is focused on uh, the interest of the individual countries and where those interests intersect, that those are, are the basis of uh, where we can collaborate and, uh, and cooperate. Um, but these are serious issues that are in play, I think rightfully so. My operations uh, um, that, that 
uh, may be directed to uh, establish and affirm uh, a U.S. government's position. Uh, those decisions are uh, held at the U.S. government level back in Washington, D.C., not my level. And I would suggest that uh, this, this dialogue in the background about joint patrols or collaborative patrols or collaborative exercises, those discussions uh, are best at the national level. Um, and then once the, the countries decide on the way forward, then it is turned to us as naval le leaders to uh, determine how best to implement that guidance from, uh, from the government level. Uh, thanks, Rory. Um, Ewan Graham from the Lowy Institute. Um, nice to see you again, Admiral. Last time I saw you, you were cutting a cake on Blue Ridge uh, when you were still um, with the Seventh Fleet. Um, welcome to Australia. Um, two quick questions. One, um, given that you transitioned from the Seventh Fleet to um, Commander Pack Fleet, does the region look any different to you from those two vantage points? Does it matter where you, where you sit? It's a lot bigger. <laughs> And the second point to bring you again, I'm afraid, back to the South China Sea. Um, with your, um, from a naval perspective, what, it's a hypothetical. But if you were to lose your access internationally enshrined to the South China Sea, what practical impact would it have on you as a commander? How important is it? And could you live without that? Yeah, so in, in uh, uh, to address your first question, um, Certainly my responsibilities from a geographic perspective were much smaller as, as the Seventh Fleet Commander, although the tyranny of distance certainly affects the Seventh Fleet Commander's uh, perspective uh, every day. Um, but it is, it is much different as the Pacific Fleet Commander. Um, I have to be attentive uh, to the policy issues and the other issues that are play in the entire region. I also have a much larger responsibility for uh, the sustainment of the force that I'm responsible for. So there's over 200 ships, uh, over 1,000 aircraft. Uh, I have over 140,000 uh, sailors that are assigned to Pacific Fleet. Um, so there's a, there's a business element of my responsibilities as the Pacific Fleet commander um, that consumes a significant piece of my time that was not the case when I was the, uh, when I was the Seventh Fleet commander. Look, I think the question that you ask is not an uncommon question, and I hear it many times for, uh, from those that I speak to in the region. But it's not, this isn't a naval issue. Uh, one of my frustration is, and I commented in, in my comments today, is this unpacking of the freedom of navigation. The, the issue is not the impact on me as a, as a military sailor. The issue is the impact from an economic perspective and from a rules-based perspective. Uh, the dialogue that's occurring uh, across the region about uh, the impact of national laws being applied in international space to NGOs, to uh, uh, commercial interests, to uh, internet access, to uh, uh, privacy uh, requirements. That, that is what I hear in the region as I speak to business leaders, government leaders, uh, military leaders. That's what the core issue. I think it is important that, that your question is a hypothetical. That's not an expectation of something that is going to occur. Um, but it, if it were to occur, uh, the implications are far beyond the scope of anything that's uh, military in nature. It's much broader than that. Uh, Dr. Malcolm Davis, Australian Strategic Policy Institute. At the moment, the Chinese uh, are focused very much on the near and middle seas and developing capabilities uh, for offshore active defence there. But they're moving, obviously, in regards to the 21st century Maritime Silk Road, they're gradually starting to build the sort of capabilities to project power into the Indian Ocean. So do you think that one possible response to China's moves in that regard would be to resuscitate the quadrilateral um, uh, security arrangements, the Quad, uh, comprising India, Japan, Australia, and the United States? Yeah, so the, I, the question is a little bit beyond the scope of my responsibilities. So let me approach it this way. I'm, I'm not a policymaker, and I, I'm, I'm not here to give policy advice to people that aren't interested in getting it from me. Uh, <laughs> The, uh, but I will say there needs to be a separation of what's happening economically in the region. It, the, the economic growth is stunning, and it, and it continues. And, and to correlate uh, economic growth with something that's more sinister, I, I think we need to be very careful about that. The challenge is the lack of transparency of many nations about what their intent is. But every time we see a, a, an economic investment, 
um, I am uh, reluctant to correlate a military significance to that. Uh, we, I think, I, I haven't found anybody that would disagree with me that everyone wants a, a strong and emerging uh, China. It, everyone is, is lifted by that. The question that I get from the region is, um, by what rule set will that will govern that emergence? Um, I would defer to others on the value of the uh, uh, one belt, uh, one road, um, from the economic perspectives. Uh, you know, I see uh, that there's value there, but I'm certainly not a not a uh, not an economist, and and I do think it would be premature to think in terms of do current security structures. Do we need to rethink those based on what is I think something that's welcomed by the region is, is a vibrant and growing uh, Chinese economy. Look, we're getting short of time. Uh, if there are no more questions from the room for the moment, I might just um, pose a question to the Admiral uh, myself, turning to the alliance context of some of the conversations that we're having in this conference and elsewhere. Uh, and of course, there are a number of US alliances in the region, but uh, of course, in this in this town, the uh, uh, alliance with Australia matters uh, matters perhaps a little more than the others. Uh, the alliance, U.S. alliance with Japan, is also of enormous significance. It'd be, it would be interesting to hear some of your reflections on um, how do you see mutual expectations in those alliances uh, moving forward, and in particular, any reflections you have on the Australian Defence White Paper that was released yeah. recently. <clears throat> the uh, uh, a couple of points I would make. I guess I would start to say that that. Uh, the United States has seven formal alliances uh, across the world. Five of them are here in the Pacific. Uh, so those that, that uh, sometimes take exception uh, to what the President has characterized the United States as being a, uh, a Pacific nation, I would, I would point to that. In fact, one of the oldest uh, alliances, treaty alliances that we have is, is with uh, Thailand, which is one of the first alliances that we signed as a as a new nation, um, and certainly Japan and and uh, and Australia are a part of that sphere. Those alliances are interesting because it gives us a structure on which to build relationships, and from that perspective, it's useful. Um, but I, the other term I talk about our allies, our partners, and friends, and I include in in my definition of what friends are, I include China. As I said, the exchanges that we have at sea. Captain to captain, or by and large, are are very formal and positive, and where they get directive from policy issues, they're by script. It's it's clearly a, a script that is describing the nation, the national perspective of the flag that flies uh, from that uh, from that vessel. Um, I have a strong relationship uh, with Admiral Su and Admiral Wu, as I mentioned as well. So I think the term friends is is broadly inclusive, in my perspective. It's also important to note that there's many countries in the region that we don't have uh, formal alliances with, that we have long and lasting relationships with. Certainly from a maritime perspective, there's a series of exercises that, that we refer to as carrot, that uh, we interact broadly in a multilateral and uh, bilateral way with uh, countries throughout the region and, and have for, uh, for many years. Um, so I think there is a, uh, a strong uh, relationship of understanding across the region um, in which to uh, continue this effort of focusing on um, those mechanisms that have uh, ensured the stability that we all have enjoyed over the last uh, 70 years. I, I was, uh, I, I'm, you know, all my comments are my own. I'm not speaking for the U.S. Uh, government, and I wouldn't presuppose others that might be assessing the recent white paper. Um, but I was struck in, in reading it. I was th words that come to my mind are consistency, um, as it I, it wasn't uh, there weren't major changes in there uh, that I saw. The specificity of it, uh, quite frankly, I was quite envious of. Um, the stunning of of direct, clear guidance uh, from the government of uh, where they were going internally, uh, and then the the uh, physical. Uh, commitment to it, that there was actually a, a commitment from a budget perspective of uh, putting reality uh, behind uh, the measures that were discussed. I thought it was uh, uh, broadly joint in nature. I'm very pleased as a naval officer to see the uh, commitment to uh, uh, Admiral Barrett's naval forces. I'm going to enjoy lunch with him uh, here shortly. 
but the other uh, services of the uh, Def Australian Defense Forces as well. Um, I, I, it, it makes me very comfortable to see that white paper as uh, a continued affirmation of the relationship that I join, uh, that I enjoy uh, with the, uh, um, the Australian Air Force, the Australian Navy, and uh, the Australian Army, the ground forces. So, thank you. Admiral, thank you very much. Look, it just remains, it just remains for me to say a few last words to close this session, and I know we'll be going straight into another session, so most of you will probably want to remain, remain in place. But um, look, it's very, I think, pleasing from the perspective of the university and the National Security College, and indeed, I think, uh, colleagues in the room here from other Australian institutions, that you've given a very, a very thoughtful, a very considered, a very substantial uh, set of remarks to us today, and I, I uh, appreciate the, uh, the grace and the professionalism with which you've taken the questions uh, as well. Uh, the Alliance with the United States, as the, um, the Vice Chancellor pointed out in his remarks, uh, and as the White Paper emphasises, uh, remains critically important to Australia's uh, security, Australia's future. We are, as a nation, uh, deepening other relationships in the very context that you've, you've described, and this conference is a chance to really explore all of that. So it just remains for me to, to really to thank you and to ask uh, the rest of the audience to join me in expressing their, uh, their appreciation. Thank you.